We will hunt down terrorists who threaten our country wherever they are. Yet another war in the Middle East to stop terrorism? Since 1980, we have militarily intervened at least 35 times in more than 27 countries. But we're no safer as a result, because perpetual war fuels terrorism. And yet, in Syria, the plan is to ramp up military assistance to the Syrian opposition. But we've tried arming friendly rebels before. We armed the Mujahideen in Afghanistan to fight the Soviets. They later became Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, who not only attacked us, but terrorized their own people. And in Iraq, we will conduct a systematic campaign of airstrikes against these terrorists. This strategy is one that we have successfully pursued in Yemen and Somalia for years. We ramped up strikes in Yemen in 2009. Since then, the country has seen more terrorist attacks, not fewer. Terrorist attacks in Somalia also keep increasing. When we only respond with military force today, we create tomorrow's enemy. All it's doing is increasing uh, militancy and hatred, anti-Americanism. Tell me how we're winning if every time we kill one, we create 10. Perpetual war does not make the world safer. Share this, because President Obama needs to stop and think. How does this end? Hello, welcome to The Trues. I'm your host, Russell Brand. Trues is the news. If the news was true, this is The Trues. Subscribe here to The Trues. Subscribe, actually, because it helps us to get more delicious power with which we will eventually start our own evil empire. Today on The Trues, we are analysing Barack Obama's speech last week about military activity in the Middle East. The Trues today is brought to you by the concept of, uh, just because someone's saying something on the telly, don't trust them, go with your own intuitive reaction. You can even do it with what I just said then, but then if you do do it, you're sort of a group, I mean, you're in a paradox. Let's have a look at the speech. We will hunt down terrorists who threaten our country wherever they are. That's a lovely start already. <laughs> we'll hunt them down. Like, you know how like sort of when someone is brutally murdered, there's like you feel a visceral reaction because of the brutality. And there's a temptation to use rhetoric that's appealing in, in within the lexicon of violence we will hunt down terrorists like yeah good because i'm feeling this feeling why are you feeling that feeling because of the brutality you don't like brutality i, I don't like brutality what's the solution then to this problem brutality could we use a, well is it you don't like brutality or is it you don't like brutality from people that live in a certain geographical region or a certain color or have a certain belief system because here's my view don't like any brutality. I think it's very important to acknowledge that the free men that have brutally, terribly, unforgivably, tragically been beheaded have only been so subsequent to airstrikes. And in fact, the airstrikes have been directly blamed by the perpetrators as the reason that they're doing it. Brutality begets brutality. That means I will not hesitate to take action against ISIL in Syria as well as Iraq. This is a core principle of my presidency. Well, it's good that you've got some core principles in your presidency because it's beginning to look like you don't have any principles at all. Like George Bush before and Barack Obama has inaugurated another Iraq war. This is a war. This is a war. This is a war. This is after winning his presidency on a pledge to end the second Iraq war. A year ago, Barack Obama said, I've spent four and a half years working to end wars, not to start them. Well, he's just literally started a war. What's going on? in that region of the world. It just seems like perpetual war for perpetual peace, isn't it? It's like, it seems that there's always some reason to have a war. If you threaten America, you will find no safe haven. What I can also see here is that's dramatic rhetoric, isn't it? Like, like either, look, people need to see a strong leader. You know, if you ever watch Fox News about Barack Obama, one of the things they're always saying about him, oh, he's weak, he's, he's listless uh, and insipid. So here, it seems like he's more concerned with seeming all tough than actually delivering a solution to the problem. Because the suggested solutions to the problem are, as we will see, eerily similar to the causes of the problem. This is like someone just going, I'm tough, you can trust in me. He's doing the old thumb thing, the old thumb trick. Like, let's now 
the, why don't we let the political class know? As soon as you're going like that, we know you're lying to us. I'm powerful, but not rude and powerful. I'm just nice powerful, like when you elected me. Second, we will increase our support to forces fighting these terrorists on the ground. You've done a lovely job of supporting terrorists and uh, other forces on the ground. America trained them and armed them and created the conditions under which they are thriving and flourishing by doing what they're doing now. So like every, it's almost like every single facet of it has been caused by the policies that he's now about to a, a further time roll out. In June, I deployed several hundred American service members to Iraq to assess how we can best support Iraqi security forces. Now that those teams have completed their work and Iraq has formed a government, we will send an additional 475 service members to Iraq. The Iraqi government perpetrates serious human rights abuses through air airstrikes on various civilian districts, which increases support for ISIS. Despite this, the US plans to strengthen the Iraqi army. I suppose what we have to train ourselves to do is the same way as we can see that that bit of body language is a blag. When people, like, just because we hear Iraqi government, oh, it's an Iraqi government, that's nice, I'd like an Iraqi government. Iraqi government means the administrators that we put there after we deposed their leader Saddam Hussein in order to prevent things happening that are happening now though. So uh, we can't trust them just by virtue of the flags, we can't trust them just by virtue of the language. In fact, we full stop, 100% cannot trust them. As I've said before, these American forces will not have a combat mission. We will not get dragged into another ground war in Iraq. People don't want to get dragged into a ground war in Iraq though. Oh, how am I going to countenance that? Just say it's not a ground war in Iraq and it's not a combat position? When you're bombing people, some people regard that as combat. But they are needed to support Iraqi and Kurdish forces with training, intelligence, and equipment. Have you ever done any uh, <laughs> training and arming type things before? Yeah? How's that worked out? One second. In Syria. I trained him and armed him. It was in a... Shit! <laughs> That's exactly the thing we did last time! Now, it will take time to eradicate a cancer like ice. Oh, come on, mate. A cancer. Grow up. Grow up. That's, what? Cancer? A cancer. Let me check my book of good and bad things. Cancer. Bad! Like, you can't just say that, can you? Is that, that That's the level we're working at. What about that episode? Have you seen the episode of Father Ted Speed, where they, they've got to get Dougal off of a milk float that's going to blow up if it goes under a certain speed in an obvious and brilliant homage to the film speed? The Catholic Church, when trying to find a solution, the only thing they can ever suggest is doing masses. Uh, shall we do another mass? It's the only idea they can ever come up with. It's a brilliant episode. The American foreign policy and the policies of America's allies echo this. It's like, airstrikes? Yeah, but any it airstrikes that cause the problem first? Thing? Okay, we'll come back in a, a week. What's your plan? It's airstrikes! <laughs> We're trying more airstrikes. Stop having the plan to solve the problem, the cause of the problem. It's like addiction. They're addicted to war. And any time we take military action, there are risks involved. There certainly are. Well, it's not even risks. There's some sort of rigid certainties. We know what the outcome will be. This will further destabilise the region. This will create more antipathy. It will radicalise more people in that region. It will cause more people in our countries to feel uh, threatened and outcast and ostracised and angered. So we know exactly what's going to happen. It's almost like, one, you like those conditions, and two, there's another issue that you're not telling us about. Especially to the service men and women who carry out these missions. But I want the American people to understand how this effort will be different from the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. That would be nice, because, you know, it seems like it might be exactly the fucking same. The unexpressed and important reason that this raid, or this new war, this let's not call it a war war, is happening is ISIS are no longer reliant on foreign donations that have come from countries like a Qatar, I'm never confident saying that, and Saudi Arabia. It taxes the people it rules, it's got a state now, and sells oil from the fields it holds in Iraq and Syria. Stopping ISIS's funding largely means depriving it of that territory. Oh, so you're going to take the territory where there's oil? Yeah? You sure that it's like that you're not doing this because you want that oil? 
Oh, oh, God, oh. The fact that you would say that to us shows that you're the one with the pro- How could you even think that of us? Us, the people who don't ever do resource-based wars in the middle. I'm not even going to talk to you. I'm not even going to dignify that with an answer. It's like when you're lying in an argument in a relationship. It will not involve American combat troops fighting on foreign soil. This counterterrorism campaign will be waged through. It's not war. It's a counterterrorism campaign. I mean, we're down like, do you like wars? No, there's that song, War. What is it good for? There isn't, as far as I know, counterterrorism. <laughs> what is it good for? Countering terrorists. Say it again. <laughs> through a steady, relentless effort to take out ISIL wherever they exist using our air power and our support for partners' forces on the ground. Yeah. The air power and the support of forces on the ground is what caused this problem. It's the very thing that caused this problem. The only thing they're able to eliminate is people in America don't like seeing dead American people come home with flags draped over their coffin. Just like, if you do that, you might reach the point where the domestic population go, do you know what? Can you stop doing wars over there? Because I'm sick of seeing poor people going and getting killed just for your rich people to have more access to more resources, right? So they eliminate that bit, that's the only obstacle, and then they can get on with taking their resources because no one, like, you know, no one likes a beheading. Brutality is wrong, but either brutality is wrong or it isn't. If you want brutal solutions to problems, expect brutal reactions. The strategy of taking out terrorists who threaten us while supporting partners on the front lines is one that we have successfully pursued in Yemen and Somalia for years. What's that? Yemen and Somalia? I didn't even know we were doing a war there. <laughs> yeah, no, I've been secretly doing a war there. We didn't want to worry you. <laughs> and it is consistent with the approach I outlined earlier this year, to use force against anyone who threatens America's core interests. What? America's core interests? What are America's core interests? Well, all you have to do, don't take my hippie word for it. Just look at what America's core interests are. Look at how America is run. Look at the people who benefit most from America. Look how legislation and trade agreements are set up in America and around the world. Look at America's allies. Look at the things that seem to be important to them. Look at the people within America that are oppressed, exploited, uh, beaten and killed by America's own domestic forces. Then you will see what America's core interests are. And then you can check with yourself whether or not you agree with America's core interests. America's homeland security has categorically said ISIS are not a direct threat to America. So when he says core American values, you have to think about what he means by core American values. I don't think he means the rights of people to get along and be all groovy with each other. It means American financial interest. May God bless our troops. And may God bless the United States of America. I hope God will, because what you're doing is endangering troops and you're endangering America with your negligent, foolish, repetitive, psychotic foreign policy. The job of these elected officials is to favourably resolve the problems that we're confronted with, not to pursue their own agenda relentlessly in spite of the damage and harm it causes to the people of the world and the people of their own countries. Uh, here's a lovely piece of writing by a man called Matthew Ho. Matthew Ho! What is he good for? Analyzing the situation in the Middle East. Say it again. Ho! <laughs> President Obama offered no solutions to the underlying political causes of the civil wars in Iraq and Syria. He didn't, did he? The reality of what America has pledged to do in Iraq is to assist in sheer subjugation of the Sunnis by US bombing of Sunni villages, towns and cities. The American military will also ensure that the Kurds keep the oil fields they seized this summer in northern Iraq. Oh, effectively strangling the Sunnis economically. In turn, the Sunnis in existential desperation will give full support to the Islamic State. As long as the United States is shackled with debilitating psychosis of 9-11 and the resultant moral weakness of our elected officials, the Middle East will be full of targets for our bombs. Iraq and Syrian mothers and fathers will raise children destined to kill and be killed. Jihadist narratives of crusaders will be validated and our perpetual war will be as boundless as our shame. Pretty good analysis from Matthew Hoare. It's also worth reading uh, Robert Fisk and Ian Sinclair from the Stop the War Condition. And if you want something or coalition rather and if you want something that's more um solution based look at what david swanson says about a diplomatic solution to the problems in the middle east what we can rule out as a solution is more bombing and more arming rebel factions and more causing disruption in the area and i can't imagine that i'm cleverer than all these people i can't imagine that i've worked out something that they don't know they must know the conditions there must be favorable to them economically these people don't believe in nation they believe in economics barack obama ain't different from any other american president that's preceded him except like them good ones like 
Lincoln and Washington, mind you, they probably snides. Who knows? Anyway, that is the truth. Trust no one. This is the truth. a tool that is abused to fool you and to leave you scared and confused. Truths is like the news. If the news was true, I want some truths. Let's have some truths. Boots on the ground provide a capability that can't be matched through just airstrikes. Bombing ISIS targets in Iraq is not going to be enough because all you're going to do is push them back into the safe haven that Syria has become. We need a strategic plan to absolutely wipe out ISIS. We've got to bring in our special operations forces who conduct direct assaults against command and control facilities, the leaders themselves, and critical infrastructure. We do not need rhetoric and moral support. What we need is real military capability. Do not interfere with us or else. Robert Foster on top roster with perfect precision Flipping this transmission of rap news journalism This edition, we're shocked by the apparently surplus surfeit Of worsening urgent news stories that in the world have arisen Deadly epidemics, an airliner shot down by militants Giant sinkholes confirm dire climate change predictions The slaughter of women and children, fascism And if that's not sufficient, we lost Robin Williams How does humanity manage to cope and survive With all of these calamities happening all at the same time To find out, tonight we'll tune in to the mainstream media line Hold on tight, I'll see you on the other side. Turn off the rest, tune in to the best of the best. I'm Brian Washington, one of the vets of this nation's press. The time is six, switch on your television sets to get your daily fix of headlines right here on MSNBS. In Gaza, Hamas attacks Israeli missiles with children. In Russia, could these sinkholes be a new source of free heating? In Ferguson, um, uh, nothing is happening. World mourns death of Robin Williams, national tragedy. In our main story, the Mid-Oil East is attacked by a group of ruthless savages. For deep analysis, we have an exclusive interview with General Baxter. General, a massive new threat to world peace? I know exactly what you mean. Everything will be going great, actually improving. In the American Empire, or planet Earth as some refer to it, if it wasn't for that cavalier racketeer Vladimir Putin, thanks to him it's become a dangerous planet here for humans. Putin? Frickin' Putin. He's on a killing spree. It was his missile that blew flight MH17 to smithereens. In March, he launched Operation Crimea and Punishment. Now he's set to march in and invade Ukraine. Astonishing. Seizing territory? Giving weaponry to extremist lunatics? Honestly, no surprise those arms he used to commit atrocities. Who would ever do such a thing? I know, right? Despicable. In other news, what's the latest from the state of Israel? We're sending our buddy Bibi plenty of weapons and munitions. No surprise those arms are used in heroic self-defense missions. Operation Cropping the Hedge was a crowd pleaser. It was a hell of a pinpoint operation, a cutting edge procedure. Hitting the terrorist human shields with the deftness precision in schools, hospitals, ambulances, human shelters even. Very efficient. We'll be right back after this message. Experiencing cognitive dissonance when reading the news? You may be suffering from irony sufficiency. Try Irony Guard. Removes all the painful irony so you can go about your day. Irony Guard. 
Welcome back. Many are calling for boycotts and sanctions. Your reaction? No question. Putin deserves punitive action. He's even arming Bashar al-Assad, a madman assassin who's massacring Syrian civilians by the thousands in a civil war that shows no signs of subsidence. Thankfully, we armed Syrian rebel groups to avert a crisis. You mean groups like ISIS? Yes. I mean, no. Well, kind of. Hold that thought, General. Let's give our audience some guidance. Who is ISIS? What are they seeking to do? Fortunately, they're very active on social media, too, where they cunningly disseminate their hateful deviant views. Watch their latest viral video by a recent recruit. Yo, infidels better listen. Yo, so check it. This is IS View Cops. This is scary. You're now face to face with a formidable adversary. We're ready to carry out beheadings in any enemy village and spread our rigid medieval beliefs on the Twitter feed. In it, with a military force, we blaming you back far, turning your own weapons back on you, yelling Allah who Akbar. Gonna be rock stars with rocket launchers, jacking armored cars, destined to bring Sharia law direct to your backyard. Yeah, get ready, infidels. It's time for the flames. We go psycho and stab a knife right in your brains. First we take our rack and leave the sacks. We go lines on the race. Then redraw the world map with the design Allah what it made. Timmy, dinner time! But mom! Downstairs now! You can do jihad later! General, what do you make of all of this? Bucky, these creeps are total scumbag jihadis, led by the Mac Daddy of Iraqi baddies, Bakar al Baghdadi. I heard he's 80 times eviler than Osama bin Laden. Probably. So which tyrant is giving these lunatics weaponry? Uh, well, remember how in 2003 we liberated Iraq, then armed the Iraqi army after we finished destroying the Iraqi army with our army? Yeah. The arms we armed the Iraqi army with couldn't defend the Iraqis and got hijacked as ISIS armaments. So now we're dropping our bombs to bomb the bombs we gave to them Iraqis to make Iraq safe to make Iraqi safe again. Now IS is on the rampage, expanding the caliphate. It's a reverse crusade and these fanatics love to decapitate and cut next. And they're coming for us next. That is correct. This could well be worse than 9-11 if left unchecked. So what can we do to stop them? How can we fight this? We must expand Operation Unintentionally Support ISIS by arming the Kurds, the Yazidis, and Malaysian airliners. That should put a stop to Putin inciting all this violence. Silence! What the? Stand by while we fix our devices. Sheep will have arrived to leak the lies of the mainstream media tyrants. Who the heck are you? Terrence Mills from the leave of defiance I've hijacked the feed to bring you the truth hiding behind these events these child deaths in the news are heathen sacrifices by the Illuminati check their symbol see where the line is divide it that's an I and an S multiply it what does it spell? ISIS the Egyptian goddess protector of the dead and children that's right kids but that's just the surface of the crisis upon us three massive sinkholes have appeared in the Yamal province you think it's coincidence Yamal means end of the world? forget me Thane those are tunnels for the elite to escape into the hollow earth once Obama brings the Ebola bioweapon to America what do you mean? untested vaccine injections are spreading it beyond the African area. Next is FEMA quarantine and militarized police to purchase when they bring in martial law. Just look at Ferguson. The whole world is about to go shazbot. It's a plot by the Freemasons. Is this guy Freemason? Only the Pleiadian aliens can save us. <laughs> Ridiculous. It's no laughing matter, Dork. They've deprived us of laughter by staging the death of Mork. Sorry, that was just a uh, static in the satellite dish. Lies! What? Terrence is back like a virus. I'm wireless. Now look here. I'm the host. You're just the host. Uh, now you understand why we tortured some folks? Everybody listen. The news is just a form of escapism. They make us live in comforting delusions by weaving improbable elaborate narratives to explain the system. But the truth is succinct and plausible. Reptilians. You idiot blowhead. Forget your Prozac dosage. Shut up, Baxter. Don't you have an Afghani corpse to pose with? You ass candle. Now calm down. This is a serious news channel. Up next, celebrity pet scandals. All right, I think we've witnessed enough to get a sense of how we cope in the midst of the flood of overwhelming catastrophes that's building up. Be it mainstream or moon scene, the news feed performs an indispensable function as a sort of medicinal crutch that aids us on a daily basis to deal with the crushing gravity of the tragedies and other maladies that keep humanity gripped in their clutch. Fortunately, here at Rap News, we like to say, fuck that shit. Do not adjust the language. Give us truth of injustice, candid, untampered with, free from fanciful narrative, savage ironies unredacted. For the juice is the the only remedy that can vanquish it. The Islamic militant group ISIS, formerly known as Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and recently rebranded as the so-called Islamic State, is the stuff of nightmares. They are ruthless, fanatical killers on a mission. And that mission is to wipe out anyone and everyone from any other religion or belief system and to impose Sharia law. 
The mass executions, beheadings, and even crucifixions that they are committing as they work towards this goal are flaunted like badges of pride, videotaped and uploaded for the whole world to see. This is the new face of evil. Would it interest you to know who helped these psychopaths rise to power? Would it interest you to know who armed them, funded them, and trained them? Would it interest you to know why? This story makes a lot more sense if we start in the middle. So we'll begin with the overthrow of Muammar Gaddafi in 2011. The Libyan Revolution was Barack Obama's first major foreign intervention. It was portrayed as an extension of the Arab Spring, and NATO involvement was framed in humanitarian terms. The fact that the CIA was actively working to help the Libyan rebels topple Gaddafi was no secret, nor were the airstrikes that Obama ordered against the Libyan government. However, little was said about the identity or the ideological leanings of the Libyan rebels. Not really surprising considering the fact that the leader of the Libyan rebels later admitted that his fighters included al-Qaeda-linked jihadists who had fought against Allied troops in Iraq. These jihadist militants from Iraq were part of what national security analysts commonly referred to as al-Qaeda in Iraq. And remember, al-Qaeda in Iraq was ISIS before it was rebranded. With the assistance of U.S. and NATO intelligence and air support, the Libyan rebels captured Gaddafi and summarily executed him in the street all the while enthusiastically chanting, Allah Akbar. For many who had bought the official line about how these rebels were freedom fighters aiming to establish a liberal democracy in Libya, this was the beginning of the end of their illusions. Prior to the U.S. and NATO-backed intervention, Libya had the highest standard of living of any country in Africa. This according to the UN's Human Development Index ratings for 2010. However, in the years following the coup, the country descended into chaos, with extremism and violence running rampant. Libya is now widely regarded as a failed state. Now, after Gaddafi was overthrown, the Libyan armories were looted and massive quantities of weapons were sent by the Libyan rebels to Syria. The weapons, which included anti-tank and anti-aircraft missiles, were smuggled into Syria through Turkey, a NATO ally. The Times of London reported on the arrival of the shipment on September 14, 2012. This was just three days after Ambassador Chris Stevens was killed in the attack in the U.S. Embassy in Benghazi. Chris Stevens had served as the U.S. government's liaison to the Libyan rebels since April of 2011. While a great deal of media attention is focused on the fact that the State Department did not provide adequate security at the consulate and was slow to send assistance when the attack started, Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist Seymour Hersh released an article in April of 2014 which exposed a classified agreement between the CIA, Turkey, and the Syrian rebels to create what was referred to as a rat line. The Rat Line was a covert network used to channel weapons and ammunition from Libya through southern Turkey and across the Libyan border. Funding was provided by Turkey, Saudi Arabia, and Qatar. With Stevens dead, any direct U.S. involvement in that arms shipment was buried, and Washington would continue to claim that they had not sent heavy weaponry into Syria. It was at this time that jihadist fighters from Libya began flooding into Syria as well, and not just low-level militants. Many were experienced commanders who had fought in multiple theaters. The U.S. and its allies were now fully focused on taking down Assad's government in Syria. As in Libya, this regime change was to be framed in terms of human rights. And now overt support began to supplement the backdoor channels. The growing jihadist presence was swept under the rug and covered up. However, as the rebels gained strength, the reports of war crimes and atrocities that they were committing began to create a bit of a public relations problem for Washington. It then became standard policy to insist that U.S. support was only being given to what they referred to as moderate rebels. This distinction, however, had no basis in reality. In an interview given in April of 2014, FSA Commander Jamal Marouf admitted that his fighters regularly conduct joint operations with al-Nusra. Al-Nusra is the official al-Qaeda branch in Syria. This statement is further validated in an interview given in June of 2013 by Colonel Abdel Basset al-Tawil, commander of the FSA's Northern Front. In this interview, he openly discusses his ties with al-Nusra and expresses his desire to see Syria ruled by Sharia law. Now, 
يعني الأخوة في جبهة نصرة ونتعاون في أماكن كثيرة ماذا تؤيدون أنتم؟ ما هو شكل الدولة الذي تؤيدون؟ أنا بصراحة العبارة أنا أرغب في دولة دولة يعني يكون طبعها حضاري لكن أن يكون شرعها إسلامي Moderate rebels? Well, it's complicated. Not that this should really come as any surprise. Reuters have reported in 2012 that the FSA's command was dominated by Islamic extremists. And the New York Times had reported that same year that the majority of the weapons that Washington was sending to Syria were ending up in the hands of jihadists. For two years, the U.S. government knew that this was happening, but they kept doing it. And the FSA's ties to al-Nusra are just the beginning. In June of 2014, al-Nusra merged with ISIS at the border between Iraq and Syria. So, to review, the FSA is working with al-Nusra, al-Nusra is working with ISIS, and the U.S. has been sending money and weapons to the FSA, even though they've known since 2012 that most of these weapons are ending up in the hands of extremists. Do the math. In that context, the sarin gas attacks of 2013, which turned out to have been committed by the Syrian rebels, makes a lot more sense, doesn't it? If it wasn't enough that UN investigators, Russian investigators, and Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Seymour Hersh all pinned that crime on Washington's proxies, the rebels themselves threatened the West that they would expose what really happened if they were not given more advanced weaponry within one month. أن ندحر هذا النظام المجرم شهر واحد إذا وجدنا أن هذا المجتمع الدولي سيتابع في تخازله تجاه ثورتنا سنفصح عما لدينا من إثباتات وأنا أقول ذلك وأعتقد أنك تعرف جيدا أننا صادقون فيما أقول This threat was made on June 10th, 2013. In what can only be described as an amazing coincidence, just nine days later, the rebels received their first official shipment of heavy weapons in Aleppo. After the second sarin gas fiasco, which was also exposed and therefore failed to garner public support for airstrikes, the U.S. continued to increase its training and support for the rebels. In February of 2014, Haaretz reported that the U.S. and its allies in the region, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and Israel, were in the process of helping the Syrian rebels plan and prepare for a massive attack in the south. According to Haaretz, Israel had also provided direct assistance in military operations against Assad four months prior. Then in May of 2014, PBS ran a report in which they interviewed rebels who were trained by the U.S. in Qatar. According to those rebels, they were being trained to finish off soldiers who survived attacks. Quote, They trained us to ambush regime or enemy vehicles and to cut off the road. They also trained us on how to attack a vehicle, raid it, retrieve information or weapons and munitions, and how to finish off soldiers still alive after an ambush. This is a blatant violation of the Geneva Conventions. It also runs contrary to conventional military strategy. In conventional military strategy, soldiers are better off left wounded, because this ends up costing the enemy more resources. Executing captured enemy soldiers is the kind of tactic you use when you want to strike terror in the hearts of the enemy. It also just happens to be standard operating procedure for ISIS. One month after this report, in June of 2014, ISIS made its dramatic entry crossing over the Syrian border into Iraq, capturing Mosul, Baji, and almost reaching Baghdad. The internet was suddenly flooded with footage of drive-by shootings, large-scale death marches, and mass graves. And of course, any Iraqi soldier that was captured was executed. Massive quantities of American military equipment was seized during that operation. ISIS took entire truckloads of Humvees. They took helicopters, tanks, and artillery. They photographed and videotaped themselves and advertised what they were doing on social media. And yet, for some reason, Washington didn't even try to stop them. U.S. military doctrine clearly calls for the destruction of military equipment and supplies when friendly forces cannot prevent them from falling into enemy hands. But that didn't happen here. ISIS was allowed to carry this equipment out of Iraq and into Syria unimpeded. The U.S. military had the means to strike these convoys, but they didn't lift a finger, even though they had been launching drone strikes in Pakistan that same week. Why would they do that? Though Obama plays the role of a weak, indecisive, liberal president, and while pundits from the right have had a lot of fun with that image, this is just a facade. Some presidents, like George W. Bush, rely on overt military aggression. Obama gets the same job done, but he prefers covert means. Not really surprising considering that Zygmunt Brzezinski was his mentor. Uh, somebody who uh, has over decades trained 
some of the most prominent foreign policy specialists, uh, not just in the Democratic Party, but uh, has trained a number uh, who ended up in the Republican Party as well. Uh, he is one of our most outstanding scholars, uh, one of our most outstanding thinkers. Uh, he has proven to be an outstanding friend uh, and somebody who I've learned an immense amount from. Uh, and for him to support me in this campaign and then uh, be willing to come out uh, here to Iowa is a testimony to his generosity. So if everybody could please give Dr. Brzezinski another round of applause. Those who know their history will remember that Zygmunt Brzezinski was directly involved in the funding and arming of Islamic extremists in Pakistan and Afghanistan in order to weaken the Soviets. U.S. National Security Advisor Brzezinski flew to Pakistan to set about rallying resistance. He wanted to arm the Mujahideen without revealing America's role. On the Afghan border near the Khyber Pass, he urged the soldiers of God to redouble their efforts. We know of their deep belief in God, and we are confident that their struggle will succeed. That land over there is yours. You'll go back to it one day because your fight will prevail and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again because your cause is right and God is on your side. By the way, Osama bin Laden just happened to be one of these anti-Soviet freedom fighters that the U.S. was funding and arming. This operation is no secret at this point, nor are the unintended side effects. I mean, let's remember here, the people we are fighting today, we funded 20 years ago. And we did it because we were locked in this struggle with the Soviet Union. They invaded Afghanistan, and we did not want to see them control Central Asia, and we went to work. Officially, the U.S. government's arming and funding of the Mujahideen was a response to the Soviet invasion in December of 1979. However, in his memoir entitled From the Shadows, Robert Gates, director of the CIA under Ronald Reagan and George Bush Sr., and Secretary of Defense under George W. Bush and Barack Obama, revealed that the U.S. actually began the covert operation six months prior with the express intention of luring the Soviets into a quagmire. The strategy worked. The Soviets invaded, and the ten years of war that followed are considered by many historians as being one of the primary causes of the fall of the USSR. This example doesn't just establish precedent. What we're seeing happen in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria right now is actually a continuation of an old story. Al Nusra and ISIS are ideological and organizational descendants of these same extremist elements that the U.S. government made use of 30 years ago. The U.S. then went on to create a breeding ground for these extremists by invading Iraq in 2003. Had it not been for the vacuum of power left by the removal and execution of Saddam, Al Qaeda in Iraq, aka ISIS, would not exist. And had it not been for Washington's attempt at toppling Assad by arming, funding, and training shadowy militant groups in Syria, there is no way that ISIS would have been capable of storming into Iraq in June of 2014. On every level, no matter how you cut it, ISIS is a product of the U.S. government's twisted and decrepit foreign policy. Now, all of this may seem a bit contradictory to you as you've watched the drums of war against ISIS begin to beat louder and louder, and as the airstrikes against them are gradually widened. Why would the U.S. help a terrorist organization get established? only to attack them later. Well, why did the CIA put Saddam Hussein in power in 1963? Why did the US government back Saddam in 1980 when he launched a war of aggression against Iran, even though they knew that he was using chemical weapons? Why did the US fund and arm Islamic extremists in Afghanistan against the Soviets? There's a pattern here, if you look closely. This is a tried and true geopolitical strategy. Step one, build up a dictator or extremist group, which can then be used to wage proxy wars against opponents. During this stage, any crimes committed by these proxies are swept under the rug. Step two, when these nasty characters have outlived their usefulness, that's when it's time to pull out all that dirt from under the rug and start publicizing it 24-7. This obviously works best when the public has no idea how these bad guys came to power. Step three, finally, when the public is practically begging the government to do something, a solution is proposed. Usually, the solution involves military intervention, the loss of certain liberties, or both. ISIS is extremely useful. They have essentially done Washington's dirty work by weakening Assad. In 2014, while the news cycle is focused almost exclusively on Ukraine and Russia, ISIS made major headway in Syria, and as of August, they controlled 35% of the country. Since ISIS is largely based in Syria, this gives the U.S. a pretext to move into Syria. Sooner or later, the U.S. will extend the airstrikes into Assad's backyard. 
And when they do, U.S. officials are already making it clear that both ISIS and the Syrian government will be targeted. That, after all, is the whole point. Washington may allow ISIS to capture a bit more territory first, but the writing is on the wall, and it has been for some time now. The Obama administration has repeatedly insisted that this will never lead to boots on the ground. However, the truth of the matter is that anyone who understands anything about military tactics knows full well that ISIS cannot be defeated by airstrikes alone. In response to airstrikes, ISIS will merely disperse and conceal their forces. ISIS is not an established state power which can be destroyed by knocking out key government buildings and infrastructure. These are guerrilla fighters who cut their teeth in urban warfare. To significantly weaken them, the war will have to involve ground troops. But even this is a lost cause. U.S. troops could certainly route ISIS in street-to-street -street battles for some time, and they might even succeed in fully occupying Syria and Iraq for a number of years. But eventually, they will have to leave. And when they do, it should be obvious what will come next. The puppets that the U.S. government has installed in the various countries that they have brought down in recent years have proven without exception to be utterly incompetent and corrupt. No one that Washington places in power will be capable of maintaining stability in Syria. Period. Right now, Assad is the last bastion of stability in the region. He is the last chance they have for a moderate, non-sectarian government, and he is the only hope of anything even remotely resembling democracy in the foreseeable future. If Assad falls, Islamic extremists will take the helm. They will impose Sharia law, and they will do everything in their power to continue spreading their ideology as far and wide as they can. If the world truly wants to stop ISIS, there's only one way to do it. One, first and foremost, the U.S. government and its allies must be heavily pressured to cut all support to the rebels who are attempting to topple Assad. Even if these rebels that the U.S. is funding and arming were moderate, and they're not, the fact that they are forcing Assad to fight a war on multiple fronts only strengthens ISIS. This is lunacy. Two, the Syrian government should be provided with financial support, equipment, training, and intelligence to enable them to turn the tide against ISIS. This is their territory. They should be the ones to reclaim it. Now, obviously this support isn't going to come from the U.S. or any NATO country, but there are a number of nations who have a strategic interest in preventing another regime change and chaotic aftermath. If these countries respond promptly, as in right now, they could preempt a U.S. intervention. And as long as this support does not include the presence of foreign troops, doing so will greatly reduce the likelihood of a major confrontation down the road. Three, the U.S. government and its allies should be aggressively condemned for their failed regime change policies, and the individuals behind these decisions should be charged for war crimes. This would have to be done on a nation-by-nation -nation level, since the U.N. has done nothing but enable NATO aggression. While this may not immediately result in these criminals being arrested, it would send a message. This can be done. Malaysia has already proven this by convicting the Bush administration of war crimes in absentia. Now, you might be thinking, this all sounds fine and good, but what does it have to do with me? I can't influence this situation. That perspective is quite common. For most people, it's paralyzing. But the truth is, we can influence this. We've done it before, and we can do it again. I'll be honest with you, though. It's not going to be easy. To succeed, we're going to have to start thinking strategically. Like it or not, this is a chess game. If we really want to rock the boat, we have to start reaching out to people in positions of influence. This could mean talking to broadcasters at your local radio station, newspaper, or TV station. Or it could mean contacting influential bloggers, celebrities, business figures, or government officials. Reaching out to current serving military and young people who may be considering joining up is also important. But even if it's just your neighbor or your coworker, every single person that we can reach brings us closer to critical mass. If you get discouraged, just remember what's at stake. About 10 days after 9-11, I went through the Pentagon and I saw Secretary Rumsfeld and and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz. I went downstairs just to say hello to some of the people on the Joint Staff who had used, used to work for me. And one of the generals called me and he said, Sir, you got to come in. You got to come in and talk to me a second. I said, Well, you're too busy. He said, No, no. He says, you, We've made the decision we're going to war with Iraq. This was on or about the 20th of September. I said, We're going to war with Iraq. Why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> He said, I guess they don't know what else to do. So uh, I said, well, did they find some information collect connecting Saddam to Al-Qaeda? He said, no, no. He says, there's nothing new that way. They just made the decision to go to war with Iraq. He said, I guess it's like we don't know what to do about terrorists, but we've got a good military and we can take down governments. And um, he said, I guess if, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem has to look like a nail. So I came back to see him a few weeks later, 
And by that time we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, he said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense's office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. If this message resonates with you, then spread it. If you want to see the big picture, trust me, we've got some very interesting reports coming. Subscribe to Storm Clouds Gathering on YouTube and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Google+. Also be sure to go to our website, scgnews.com, and sign up for email updates.